Hello, nice to see everybody. My name is Kelly Haley and I'm a reference librarian upstairs, but this afternoon I get to do this and introduce Doug. Um, welcome everyone who's here and welcome to our viewers live streaming as well. Doug began his woodworking career in 1976 and he founded the Eureka Springs Guild of Artists and Craftspeople in 1977. By the mid-90s, he had started writing books and also articles about woodworking. He's the founder of the Wisdom of Hands program at the Clear Springs School, which is a small independent school in Eureka. And he has also been named an Arkansas Living Treasure by the Arkansas Arts Council for his work with wood and in education. He's published over 100 articles in various woodworking magazines and educational journals, and he has written 13 books on woodworking. Um, he is selling one, his latest one here today. That's your latest, right, Doug? Yeah. And then he has a couple more. Um, in addition to his newest book, the newest one that's here today is just called The Wisdom of Our Hands. Doug continues to teach woodworking, grades one through 12 at the Clear Springs School. And he also works daily in his own wood shop. And he travels around teaching adult woodworking also at um, various clubs and schools. He lives in a hardwood forest at the edge of Eureka Springs with his wife, Jean. Please help me welcome Doug. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is the, is the microphone working? Okay, good. So, um, I brought some boxes that are at the back there that you're welcome to look at. I, those are the only samples of my work that I brought with me. Um, but I think it's always good to um, kind of see a little bit about uh, where someone's coming from. Um, I, uh, I started woodworking actually when I was 14 years old. And, and well, one of my earliest memories of my father was hammering a nail and learning how to not hit my thumb, you know, which I did multiple times. Um, my father bought a shopsmith for me for my birthday when I was 14. So it and I are the same age. We're both 1948 models. Uh, I came to Eureka Springs in 1975, at the end of 1975, um, to join a pottery co-op. And I started out my craft career as a potter. And um, when the pottery ran out of money and folded, I went on to work at a place called Arkansas Primitives, which was a place that um, made furniture out of old barn boards. We would um, go, we had a, one crew that would go out and take boards off old barns and replace them with new wood. And then they'd bring them back and I'd go out and I'd sweep the snow off of them and then build things. Um, china cabinets and things are all very scripted to a certain design. And it wasn't the kind of woodworking that I would consider the uh, finest example of, um, of workmanship, uh, put together with nail guns. And um, we got a, uh, a bill at one time from a company in Florida that said they had to fumigate and kill all the power post beetles that we dragged into their <laughs> store. And, uh, and so um, it wasn't exactly fine woodworking, but it gave me some basic skills. And um, another thing that had happened though earlier, when I was going to college, I'd been, um, I bought a 1930 Model A Ford. And that Model A Ford, I decided I was gonna take it down to the bare frame and build it back as almost a new car, which I spent summers doing that, working in my father's hardware store and then taking time off to go and work on my Ford. And then, um, so I had that car, drove it to school my sophomore year of college. And um, my senior year, I was having a lot of trouble with things. Things had become very abstract and kind of, um, I didn't see where they were leading. I didn't see any meaning to what I was doing each day. And so I was thinking of dropping out and I thought I'd stop and visit my friend Jorge who had helped me rebuild the antique Ford. And, um, and I explained my situation. I was gonna tell my parents I was gonna drop out and 
I told Georgie before that I was planning to become a lawyer because my grandfather was a lawyer and my great-grandfather was a lawyer and my father had skipped a generation, now is expected of me. And, um, and Georgie said, I just can't, I can't see you as a lawyer, he said. It's so obvious to me that your brains are in your hands. And that was a um, kind of a shocking thing, you know, because we don't think of the brains and the hands as actually being connected. In fact, we've had a long history um, in which you have manual labor here on the left and you've got the intelligentsia on the right and you've got your choice that you had to make in high school, whether you're going to college and would be in the college prep track or whether you're going to go into the trades, which were considered like a, a dead end with, um, you know, challenging employment, right? And, um, and so my friend saying, your brains are in your hands, just kind of struck me. And I thought, well, you know, that's an that's a interesting observation that I could see the truth of. Because when I was um, working on my antique Ford, my attention was always there. It was always deep into whatever I was doing. And then when I would be in school sitting at a, at a desk and I noticed my mind wandering in and out, you know, sometimes my mind would be focused on what the teacher was gonna tell me and then sometimes not. And I, I realized that, okay, well, maybe, maybe this guy Georgie was right. And so when I, um, I managed to graduate from college, um, I think as a gift from my professors who felt uh, some sympathy for me, um, behavioral statistics was a thing that just about put an end to my <laughs> academic career um, because it's so abstract and it's all about the manipulation of data. And um, so, when I got out of school, I thought, well, what am I going to do now? And so I moved to Eureka Springs, Arkansas, and became a potter and then a woodworker as a fulfillment of my friend Georgie's pronouncement that I had my brains in my hands. And then I began thinking about it, and I realized that that's not just true for me, that um, many of us have deep connections, a deep calling for what our hands offer to us. And that the, uh, the hands actually, um, and so I started this program at Clear Spring School called The Wisdom of the Hands. Uh, Jan was a friend of mine at that time and, um, and she was teaching in the Eureka Springs, she was a counselor at the public school in Eureka. And uh, so I started this program called The Wisdom of the Hands. The idea was to show that the hands and the brain are actually connected to each other. And as a consequence, um, I became connected with a, a friend, Frank Wilson, who wrote a book about the hand. And, um, and he said that the hands and the brain co-evolved as a system. It wasn't like one came first like a chicken or an egg, that they came together. So. Um, so based on my program, The Wisdom of the Hands, now The Wisdom of the Hands uh, title came from uh, a poet. Um, he was, what was his name? It'll come to me. They say that if you're having difficulty remembering something, move your hands around <laughs> and it may come to you. It's not working right now, but. Um, you, some of you uh, may, may remember he was a, the poet laureate of the United States. He, he wrote about the wisdom of the body. And he was on uh, public radio and he talking in that deep poet's voice the way they do about the wisdom of the body. And for me, the wisdom of the body really was right, right here, you know, because these, now my daughter might have a different look at it, you know, because she was into ballet and you could call it the wisdom of the feet. But in any case, um, the, what we know comes primarily to us and most vehemently to us through actual experience and not through what other people say, right? In German, they have two, two phrases. One is uh, to describe knowledge, Kentness, which is 
things that you learn by doing directly in Wissenschaft, which is, I, I know I don't, I know I butcher the German, but, um, but it, things that you learn second or third hand, like from books and that kind of thing. And so um, I became convinced that one of the best things you could do in education was to make balance between what you could learn through books and other people's experience and what you actually would learn from doing things yourself. So I started a woodworking program at Clear Spring School uh, with the idea that it would kind of um, serve as a demonstration or, or model through which we could better understand um, the way we all learn. And I think, and I always, when I say we all learn, I'm, I, I mean that. Um, even if you have a very strong academic inclination, you devour books as fast as they fall into your lap, they're enriched by having real experience in the real world. Um, for example, uh, Donald Harrington was a favorite uh, author here in, in Fayetteville and taught at the University of Arkansas. And all of his work was, liter was filled with things that, uh, tools and things that were related to the hands. And if you, if you go back and read any of his things, you'll see that a lot of what he was conveying wasn't because he had some kind of fantasy out there but because he'd been involved as a direct observer of real life, right? So I want to talk a little bit about my book and if I, uh, and, and maybe do a, a couple readings from it. And I'd also like to take some questions from you guys. And um, I want to, uh, first of all, uh, the wisdom of our hands. You know, my program was called Wisdom of the Hands and that's kind of like, um, stiff, right? And it implies that the hands are these abstract things out there. So um, I call this the wisdom of our hands because it's not just about my learning through what I have done and what I do, but that it's a journey that we're all on together and that these are our hands. And um, so I, I've got the book kind of divided into not as sections, but as chapters, and the early ones are related to the movement in depth that any craftsman goes through. And if I'm, you know, if I'm saying craftsman, I'm not saying only about people who craft things with their hands. I think about poets as well, because poets are always crafting things in the same way that we do. They may pronounce things and read things to themselves to refine and redefine uh, what they're trying to say. And, um, and, and I try to make it clear that when I'm talking about woodworking, I'm not just talking about woodworking. The same things apply to all crafts and to cooking and of course to gardening, but I start basically with my engagement with the materials because the materials of wood were the thing that really captured me. I could have become in love with steel, you know. I was in love with clay for a while. But you have to get deep into the materials to do anything really meaningful with it. So that means you want to understand the materials, whether it's the yarn or the, or the, um, or the spices or the the soil, uh, it's, it's plunging deep into things that you really get the most results. Um, and by results, what do I, what do I mean? You know, um, one is the depth of engagement. You know, uh, the deeper you go into things, the, the, the finer the rewards that come back to you. So, uh, the first chapter is about materials because I want people to have kind of a little bit of insight into wood as a, as a material, as a stand-in for what other, whatever other kinds of materials you are investigating and invested in. I wanted the wood to serve as an example of how you move deeply into the material world. Then the second chapter is about tools. And 
the way tools shape the intellect. And when you think about tools, <clears throat> a hammer seems like such a simple thing, you know, and yet a hammer is a thing that evolved through our civilization for generations. And originally it was the fist, the ability to hit with your own hand which then was translated into a rock, which was then formed in steel, which then, um, and so when you're talking about a tool, you're not just talking about a, a thing that you hold in your hand or a thing that you manipulate with a, with a keyboard. You're talking about intelligence that's been in, accumulated through the entire history of man. So um, I want people to look a little more deeply into tools and the way they become an extension of the intellect. Um, one of the examples I, I describe is um, the blind man walking with his stick. And the first time you try walking with a stick to try to find your way, you're feeling the stick in your hand as you're moving it back and forth. And then after practice, you're actually feeling the surface of the cement that you're walking over. The tool becomes an extension of the mind, so it's not just that the tool is something that allows you to do something, the tool is something that allows you to see things. And to, um, so uh, the, uh, the third chapter is um, about technique, because of course technique is a way that the tools are then used, and the fourth chapter is about design. And then I go on into some of the, um, what I think of as kind of the richer terrain. And that's the way what we do affects who we are. So for example, when I was uh, teaching at Clear Spring School, I had, um, I would teach um, seventh and eighth graders how to turn wood on the lathe. And as I would watch them turning wood on the lathe, it wasn't just that the shape was being formed there on the lathe and the sawdust was going on the floor. There were things that were happening inside them. Uh, the development of attention, for example, uh, to be able to really focus on something, to really let it draw you in. And then, uh, and so there, the girl standing at the lathe wasn't just shaping the wood, she was shaping herself, right? And that happens every time you engage in a creative process. Uh, so for example, uh, I identify myself as a woodworker. I, I get my title from what I do. And, um, and a woodworker behaves in certain ways and a woodworker does certain things and those give me some definition of who I am. Um, I go into some kind of unusual spaces in here. For example, one of the things uh, I talk about is forgiveness. And um, it, it's, a, it's a skill that's not practiced well enough these days. And all forgiveness really has to start with yourself and it's almost impossible to be a craftsman or an artisan in anything without making mistakes, without recovering from mistakes. And that's, it's incredible practice because when you encounter other people that have made mistakes, then you say, oh yeah, I know. I know how that is. And you also learn that your mistakes are not only things, they're not crosses that you bear your whole life. You know, wood turners talk about, um, that's not a mistake, that's a design opportunity. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a, an opportunity for reality to intrude and redirect in a way that may often end up more meaningful. And a lot of it depends on, uh, so I, this, uh, this guy in South Carolina did a review of my book for, um, for Front Porch Republic and he told how my chapter on forgiveness at that point was really important to him because he was working on a musical instrument and it just screwed things up and let off with a string of expletives and his kids heard and came running and saying, 
what's wrong, Dad? You know, and he said, a chapter on forgiveness came at just the right time for him. <laughs> and uh, because that's what happens, you know, we, we learn that we are human beings and that as human beings, we make mistakes. Um, I, I'm going to do... Um, So if the craftsman is working on the wood, but in order to work on the wood, the craftsman's also had to do a little bit of work on himself, right? He's had to hone his attention. He's had to develop some skill. And so what are the implications of that? Can, can any of you think of a better way to build a community and then to have people who are growing intentionally by working on themselves. Um, there's a poem I wish I brought with me. It's, by, it's about Kang, the master carpenter. So I'll just have to tell you this story. It's, I don't have a, a written version of it. But uh, he was, he'd made a bell, bell stand. And so if you Google Kang, K-H-A-N-G, and the bell stand, you'll find it pretty quick. But um, he made this beautiful bell stand, and everybody said, that is the work of the gods. They said, this is so, this is so unworldly, it's so beautiful. And so asked how he did it. He described the process of working on himself. And he had to bring himself to a certain point of understanding at which the tree presented itself to him. And then in collaboration with the tree, this beautiful thing emerged, which, was, which some people interpreted as divine. But the real challenge that all of us have is working on ourselves. Um, but the implications having to do with community are, are pretty striking. Um, this is uh, a little quote from Jacob Bronowski. He says, the most powerful drive in the ascent of man is his pleasure in his own skill. You see it in the magnificence with which he carves and builds, the loving care, the gaiety, the effrontery. The monuments are supposed to commemorate kings and religions, heroes, dogmas, but in the end, the man they commemorate is the builder. There are several avenues open to those who want to take part in crafting human culture. And so this is, you know, I'm talking here not just about making shit, excuse me, making stuff. I'm talking about, you know, how we have impact on the world at large and beyond the walls of our own shops, right? One is to make beautiful and useful things that enrich the lives of others. Another is to teach, be it literature, dance, music, or some other form of art. To share the gifts of culture through teaching is profound. A third way is to write, which in is, is in itself a form of teaching. A fourth way is to simply live authentically in the real world. Your example will serve others. I'm reminded of a friend who's, uh, you remember Guy Lloyd, Jan. And Guy Lloyd's dad was 98 years old, but would still go out every week with his lawnmower. He could only walk with a walker but, or with a lawnmower. He had his two ways of mobility behind the lawnmower. And what an, what an amazing thing that was for all the people that would drive by to see this 98-year-old man mowing his grass. And what a simple thing to have done. My own contributions as maker, teacher, writer, and activist were influenced by an era in which I started as a craftsman. When we hippies moved to Arkansas in the 70s from all over the United States, most of us were leaving behind things that were not much to our liking. One was a military industrial complex that sent young men and women to unnecessary war. Another was the devaluation of labor that had taken place in the American economy and culture. Another was the estrangement of the consumer from the sources of supply. Another was the cost of participating in an economy that lacked sensitivity to the environment. Many of us felt 
that the then current course of things, which has nevertheless persisted to this day, was and is unsustainable. Society at large, we felt, was in a state of moral decline. Those of us who were artisans or felt compelled to become artisans felt like we were saving a few things from being lost. Hard-earned lessons about materials, tools, techniques, and the creative human spirit. We were not just making stuff, we were saving techniques and ways of life, learning how to be closer to the land, more respectful of the environment, and more humane, just as the characters in Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 were saving books by walking around in constant recitation, we were building and saving skills that had been useful throughout the rise of humankind. If things went if things really went to hell in a handbasket, as some suspected, as some suspected they might, the skills we were mastering would be useful not only to ourselves and each other, but for crafting our own lives, but also to those we might teach in putting society back together. How to raise vegetables, goats, and chickens on poor soil and rocky hillsides is not a bad thing to know if the world is falling apart. Knowing how to make a clay pot and how to cut and dry firewood for the winter offer not only means to make a living, but also preparation for a future in which those skills might be needed. How do you make something useful from wood you have harvested from yourself, from your, harvested from your own small acreage? My community of Eureka Springs knew that even if things did not fall apart, we were learning and growing in our skills as well as in kindness and character as we encouraged each other. The, um, I've been influenced a little bit by Zen. I don't claim any kind of Zen mastery by any means. I'm a lot better at woodworking. Um, but I was intrigued by the, the, the sound of one hand clapping. So two hands clap, and there, this is a chapter called left hand, right hand. Two hands clap, and there is a sound. What is the sound of one hand? And that, that's a famous Zen cone. So there's this cone about the master who asked the young monk, what is the sound of one hand clapping? The acolyte went hither and yon, returning with what he thought might be the right answer. Is it the sound of a bell, he asked. No, it was not the sound of a bell. So the young man, the monk went out again into the world. Is it the sound of water running in a brook, he asked. Again and again he went out and came back with proposed answers to the simple question, what was the right answer? Could it be right before your nose as you take one hand and clap and listen directly for yourself. As someone who spent most of his life working with his hands, I suggest they work best in partnership. To actually clap, both hands must meet somewhere in the middle. As an experiment, take a piece of paper and try writing on it and observe how your opposing hand steadies the paper. We live in a world that's deeply divided with one faction being named left and the other right. For hundreds of years, those whose left hands were dominant were described as evil. We learn the serious error in that. Today, we live in a world that's deeply divided across a political line divided as left and right, described as left and right. I have this hypothesis that the hands actually have the potential of bringing us together just as one hand assists the work of the other just like the young monk running all over to discover the sound of one hand clapping, we've been left distrusting what's right before our noses and unprepared to accept the obvious. <clears throat> Charles H. Ham wrote in his book, Mind and Hand, it is easy to juggle with words, to argue in a circle, to make the worse appear the better reason, and to reach false conclusions which wear a plausible effect but it is not so with things. If the cylinder is not tight, the steam engine is a lifeless mass of iron of no value whatever. 
A flaw in the wheel of the locomotive wrecks a train. Through a defective flue in the chimney, the house is set on fire. A lie in the concrete is always hideous like murder it will out. Hence it is that the mind is liable to fall into grave errors, intelligence fortified by the wise counsel of the practical hand. The, um, the hands not only allow us to shape our reality, they allow us to test and learn from our reality. And while students are so often put in classrooms where they sit still at their desks and then are tested for what they have learned from the experience, some of them may do well and many do not. Many will sit there bored with their minds wandering. These are not just, you know, they think, well, dumb kids. Well, no, no dumb kids, let me tell you. They're kids that uh, don't respond well to that and are often a little smarter than that and are bored by the lessons that they're being given. And we need to create learning environments in which kids are empowered to move and learn. So I had a, uh, a friend of mine had a, had a best friend whose daughter, whose son had been, she, she's called into school because her son couldn't sit still, second grade, he couldn't sit still. And so they wanted to put him on Ritalin to uh, calm him down, you know. Kids are not designed to sit still. That's not, that's not the way we work. We, we need to be active, we need to be moving, we need to have uh, schools that respect that, that right. Um, and I could go on and on about that based on my teaching at Clear Spring School, my experience as being a son of a kindergarten teach, teacher. Um, I wanna talk a little bit, read a little bit about crafting a path forward. This is a quote from James Cranov. Some of us long to have at least something somewhere which will give us harmony and a sense of durability. I won't say permanence, but durability. Things that through the years become more and more beautiful. Things we can leave to our children. There's a thing that happens as you develop skill and expertise in a craft. When you're just starting out, few, few people beyond your immediately family, immediate family will be interested in your work. As your work develops to be more in keeping with the accepted standards in society in which you live, you can establish, oh, I'm getting tired of reading. Is that okay? I want you guys to, um, you have any questions? Yes. Regret buying any tools, and if so, uh, what did you learn from that? What What do you learn from? You buy a tool, you find out you're not using it. Uh... It's easy to buy tools these days that you don't need. Okay. Yeah, and I've had this real advantage of li by from living in Eureka Springs about buying tools. You know. I don't have a woodcraft store near me or any place where you go to find buy, buy fine tools, you know? So um, if I wanted something, I'd have to order it by mail order. And often I would find that, find myself disinclined to do that, which then means you're given the opportunity to find out what the tools that you have now will do rather than the tools that you think you need to acquire later. Does that make sense? And there's a, there's a Zen saying, poverty is your greatest treasure, never trade it for an easy life. And one of the things that happens to woodworkers a lot is that we, we see something in a, I, I write magazine articles, right? So I'm, this, this week I sent off a, a proposal for, an article, for a short article to find woodworking about how to make adjustable sled runners. Now, if you're not a woodworker, you probably won't know what a sled runner is, but 
if you're cutting things on the table saw, to have a device that allows you to move smoothly and safely through the cut, uh, it's called a sled because it has two runners. And one of the problems with runners is that they tend to, if you make them yourself out of wood, they have a tendency to expand and contract because that's what wood does. So one day you may go and the sled feels a little loose, and the next day you go and the sled's a little tight. And so then you have to scrape it or something to try to thin it to make it work, which then means the next time you want to use it, it's a little loose. So I had this idea about making my own adjustable sled runners. And um, I sent it off to Fine Woodworking. And they said, well, they're not interested in it because someone could go to the store and they could buy one of the commercial models for not much money, which then undercuts their relationship with their advertisers. Now, they didn't say that part. But so much of woodworking is now built around selling products to people that they're convinced that they need, when maybe what they need is just a little more imagination and practice in using what they already have. So I don't think I answered your question, but. It was a nice journey, though. Um, it, the um, tools are, are just, they're fascinating. And you, if you get into the rich history of them, you know, you can see how a given thing can be used for many different purposes. And, the, and it's a lot better, I think, to uh, have your, your own creative gears processing than to go to the latest catalog to see what's offered, right? So um, are, there, are there other questions? Yes? I think it's more just a comment on what you were saying about with poverty, because when I'm a photographer by trade, which is another world of gizmos if you want to get into all of that. And anytime I've taught, that would be one of the first questions is, you know, what's your favorite lens or what lens should I buy? And anytime I've ever taught people, it's like, take your basic lens and just exhaust it. Mm -hmm. You know, literally exhaust it. And then mm -hmm. at that point, if there's things it just won't do for you, then start thinking about what you need that will do what you, the direction you want to go. But we do, we're, it's like you say, we're bombarded with so much advertising that, and it's been that way, even with photography, there was, we joked from a 1908 ma magazine, what was this thing, it was, Gizmatic or something like that. There was nothing more than a wedge of glass that you could put in front of a lens and suddenly you were an artist. Mm -hmm. And there, there seems to be that promise that with all the latest and greatest you will obtain the skills and the knowledge to build or create. And really you just have to get out there and use your mind and your eyes and your hands and exhaust it. And it's, it's just more of anything, it's just a comment on what you're saying. And as a tool collector, yeah, you tend to buy something every now and then <laughs> that you wish you hadn't, or it sits. You know, it gets to a point, and my shop is at, at that point, you know, because um, I get, um, Fine Woodworking wants me to do a review of a particular um, um, device for making larger finger joints, right? And, um, and so th they're having Rockler send me this thing and I'll use it and then, uh, and then I'll tell them yes or no it worked or it worked this way or that way and it was satisfactory. So if I give a good review, then they'll publish that and then people down the chain will think they have to buy that. Um, and uh, they're paying me $500 for it, so I, I'm going to actually test it. And, um, and I'll probably not say anything bad about it. I'm just going to say whether it does what they say it's going to do or not and leave it up to people to choose 
themselves whether or not they need that. But one of the, you know, one of the things we notice about uh, computer technology is every new iteration of a program is promising to do more and more easier and easier, right? So it used to be that, um, that, that that's what it's all about, ease of use, uh, which then makes it uh, easy for them to have it done overseas, for example, you know, because you haven't developed any particular skill here that's acquired by taking and exhausting what you have, you know, as you were describing. Um, so, Yes, please. Talking about exhausting, one of the, my chief irritants in life, because I, I love to cook and I cook a lot, you know, are all the gizmos and gadgets they come up with. Like, for example, who needs a slow cooker? You know, when you can just cook something slowly <laughs> for yourself without having to plug it in and make these things happen. It's just, um, you know, I guess a comment on our culture that, uh, overproduction, more products that we really don't need to use. So I understand what both of you are saying, and I mm -hmm. agree. Well, you know, there's nothing like a small kitchen, mm -hmm. you know, because it keeps you from filling it with all these things that you don't need, you know. And to be able to make four steps to get from one side to the other instead of eight is an advantage. And uh, it, we... we we're always looking outside ourselves for the answers to things. We think that there's something out there that we need when what we maybe need is to slow down. Not An example for me is um, I can spend a week working on a piece of furniture that if cared for can last a hundred years. You know, that's not a long time to work on something that will last a hundred years, you know. And of course it depends on whether or not it's cared for. I mean, something, just because something is made doesn't mean it's going to last. Uh, very delicate things, if they're cared for, can last a long time because they're cared for and very overly robust things may be thrown away because they're, they're unpleasing to the person that would buy it or refuse it. Um, the, the, the point, of course, is that the hands, you know, if there's one thing that I could ask that people carry away from the book or from the talk is to uh, give thought and observation to what my friend had told me, that my brains are in my hands. Because that was, for me, the thing that really shifted my outlook and made me reconsider my life. And, um, and if, if, you're, if you're thinking about the fact that your brains are in your hands, you might be a little more cognizant of what the repairman is doing when he comes to fix your, fix your washing machine. You might, um, you might be a little more observant when you're going through Dallas-Fort Worth and you're seeing the attention that the man applies to cleaning the mirrors in the bathroom. You might, uh, you might just kind of look at things slightly differently and, uh, and value the things that you see coming from your farmer's market rather than from the big box store, uh, or you might value what's coming and carefully picked at great distance and transported to you because it's something that's real. And, um, and there's no, you know, there's nothing quite like picking up something and enjoying its texture, slowing yourself down, the things that you are, so for example, in woodworking, I, have, I offer some advice, and it's to slow down and, and enjoy the texture of things as they're transformed. It's not just take a router and go zoom across a board, but 
feel the results, then take a piece of sandpaper and feel the results of that. Let yourself get deeply sens sensuously involved. Um, some of what I talk about has to do with the application of the senses because the senses are key. They are the reminder that we're, we're in a real world here that we have the opportunity to savor and enjoy. And it's, um, we're, we suffer from too much internet. I'm, I know I do suffer from too much internet. So, suffer from too much abstraction. Um, have the, it, it's interesting because of my students, you know, um, and I've had, I've had a lot of students. One was a 98 year old naval propulsions instructor from Webb, which is a, um, I, I could hardly believe he was still teaching, but he made it through my class and carried home boxes at the age of 98. Um, I had a, a student who was the uh, assistant DA for Los Angeles County, but there are people that <clears throat> have their lives filled with things that they need surcease from, you know, they want to find themselves immersed in things that are more deeply meaningful. And, uh, and whether it's your garden or your cooking or your craft, uh, these things are all there and they're accessible. So I'll, I'll tell one more little last story from the book. Um, and it's about um, my wife's father, um, John, or as my daughter called him, Jaja. And uh, he was 98, 90, he's 89 years old and my wife had never been able to figure out what to give him as a gift. He'd been retired at that point for 20 years, 20 some years. And so we couldn't buy him a tie. <laughs> and so she, my wife was asking, well, what could, what could we get him this year for Christmas? And I said, well, how about a little whittling knife and a little block of wood that I could cut into something of an animal shape that he could then whittle. And my wife said, oh, I'm willing to try anything. So I bought a little woodcraft whittling knife and cut up a piece of wood, uh, basswood, so it was sort of like a dog, and put him in a package and sent him to, uh, to Florida. And um, Jaja opened the box, looked at it, and kind of puzzled over it, closed the box up, and it ended up put, being put on a shelf. And then one day, about a, a month later, he went over, he opened that box, and he took out that little dog, and he started whittling on it. And he whittled every day for the rest of his life. And um, he would always tell me, <laughs> about the new masterpiece that he was working on. <laughs> and, you know, I've, uh, I've sold my work at Silver Dollar City and I've known, you know, I've had articles of carved furniture in them and this stuff. I know what good carving is. And his carving, his whittling was not what you would call mastery. But for him, each, each day was something in which he brought some direct improvement to his own skill. And, um, and so he, he would give those things when there were grandchildren of some, one of his neighbors visiting, he would always give them things to take home. My daughter has a collection of work that Jaja had done. And, uh, and it's, not a, it's not about attaining a certain level of skill of, or mastery. It's about finding, finding pleasure in the moment and, um, and maybe distraction to a degree, you know, from the pressures of the world, but something that you feel is positive that you can reshape your uh, relationships with each other, you know, reshape the feelings that we have for each other. Um, and so that, that's kind of like, uh, that's what this book is, is about. And um, I've got copies back there and I'm glad to sign some if you wanna buy them. And I'm, I've got some boxes back there for you to look at. I've got some other books back there to 
look at to see some of my other stuff. And um, I thank you all for being so attentive. Any further questions? No? Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. That was a lot of hands clapping. Thank you.